Josh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And Matt, I also want to thank you for the incredible hospitality that you've extended in welcoming me here into Trinity. Uh, thank you for hosting this lecture in the Henry Center in particular. As many of you may know, uh, Carl F. H. Henry was instrumental in the founding of the NAE and kind of shaping its theological trajectory. So there are many points of intersection and, in fact, indebtedness uh, that I would have uh, toward Trinity and the legacy that is represented in the Henry Center. Uh, we, we certainly live in extraordinary times, right? Uh, you may recall, depending on your age and your social location, that at least for me in my childhood, there was a thing called an arcade in a thing called a shopping mall. And adolescents would go to arcades and they would take their quarters and stick it into games to play. There was one particular uh, game called Whack-A-Mole. And uh, this, this was a, a video game in which you had a plastic mallet and you had to whack five caricatured moles that would pop up in random times. And it, it was absolutely comically frenzied, the attempt, and ultimately futile. You could never get all the moles. And it was just a, a game to play. At most, you would lose a few quarters. The stakes are much higher, because right now, I think we all could say that our country is playing ideological whack-a-mole. There is, in our country, almost a frenetic, frenzied attempt to beat back what appears to be ideological threats. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum, you sense this deeply. And what's concerning to me is that the honor and mission of Jesus is implicated in this. Some of the unhealthy, unconstrained ways in which Christians are contributing to this ominous national sport of ideological whack-a-mole. And perhaps this is expressing uh, the historic moment, inflection moment that I think we are in our country and in the church. Evangelicalism in particular is facing as this, uh, this identity crisis of sorts. And it's a very painful and a real one. Real challenges exist. Question often arises, is evangelicalism something that we need to write an obituary for? Or could we be writing a birth announcement for its renewal? I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in if I didn't believe the latter to be true. But in order for that to be the case, I think we need a robust biblical faith for our common life in complex times. Now, so scripture boldly proclaims that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, from Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. You think about this. This is a reconciliation that's not only vertical, reconciling humans to God, it's not only horizontal, Recon reconciling peoples to people, but all things in heaven and on earth. There is a cosmic dimension to the reconciliation, that whatever took place at the cross, yes, deals with our separation from God. It also deals with our separation from one another, but something mysterious is happening of cosmic proportions that is affecting the heavenly realms and the things, not the people, the things on earth itself. It is a gospel that encompasses far more than we often permit it to, or even have an imagination for. It is comprehensive, it's compelling. And it's a different kind of metaphor, reconciliation. It's a metaphor that I would say is very opposite of the culture war metaphor where we are defending our positions, attacking our opponents, seeking to win ground that we may have lost to those ideological moles that are popping up. Reconciliation is a metaphor of love, care, concern, of service. So I want to do a few things. I want to spend some time in diagnosis. I want to explore a bit of what uh, a catechesis of civic discipleship would look like, and I want to explore a bit of um, our common life in a pluralistic society. Now, when we think of uh, the weather, 
there are a few different ways we can think about it. There's the daily weather report. There's also recognition in different regions of our country will have different weather patterns. Uh, there's also a sense in which there are climate, not only regions, but there are climate ages. There was once an ice age. Once this area of the country looked very different over the swath of centuries and millennia. And then, of course, there are weather catastrophes, hurricanes, earthquakes, that could change in a moment what we experience. It seems to me we are right now at a convergence of all of those. Daily weather patterns that seem out of whack, a sense that the different regions of our world, our country, are experiencing hotspots of climate issues. And we're at an inflection point that might be marking a change, not just decades worth of climate changes, but a serious change in modernity and Western life. And of course, weather catastrophes, the impact of social media, for instance, in our particular moment. What I'd like for us to do is take a step back and say, OK, we have political polarization. But frankly, political polarization has always existed in various parts of the world at various times. That's not so novel. Um, we have deep social tensions. Well, that, that's always existed at various times in various places. What I want to take a look at in this diagnosis are four areas that I think are underneath the surface tension of polarization. They are the deeper tensions that give rise to it. The first one I, I, I'm going to say is individualism without social cohesion. Now, to say that we in America, post-enlightenment, uh, with this kind of American entrepreneurial mentality, are, is an inv individualistic society. We, that's nothing new. We know this deeply. And that has a deep impact on our understanding of the gospel. We share a gospel so that people can make individual, personal decisions for Jesus. It's deeply embedded. Individualism is not new to life in America or the church. But what is different is that in the past, there was a social cohesion that undergirded American individualism and protected the church from some of its worst impulses when it comes to individualism. We still went to church. And we might go to church because we personally went to the altar call at a Billy Graham crusade. But we knew after that altar call, we had to go to a church and become a member of the church. Immigrant communities, you had that deep sense of social cohesion in the first, maybe first and second generation because of language, because of where you lived in a city. But subsequent generations have this attenuated social cohesion. One of the challenges right now is that we have an individualism without our history of social cohesion. And that has deep impacts, not only on the fabric of our life, but on the, the work of the church. I'm going to use a, an example of just what it means to be an American. There used to be a day and age, and the baby boomers represent this, in which despite all the traumas of the 1960s, of which the baby boomers were a deep part of that, those over 65 when I asked the question, are you very or extremely proud to be an American, 86% would say yes. Because there's this deep sense, however contested in the 60s and 70s what it meant to be an American, there was a deep sense in the American project. If you ask Gen Zers that question, only 36% say that they are proud, very proud, to be an American. In fact, Four out of ten Z Gen Zers believe that the founding fathers of the United States are better described as villains than as heroes. What has been lost, rightly or wrongly, whether you subscribe to 1619 or 1776 project, what has been lost is this social cohesion that would safeguard some of the worst impulses of individualism. That's one, I think, deeply embedded challenge that we have currently. That's different from any other period in American history. 
We also have institutions without social trust. A lot of how we become discipled in our public engagements are by our institutions. It's what we do when we go to book clubs at libraries or join the Rotary Club or be a part of the church or join the PTA in order to make a contribution in our educational, all in all, you know, all these things that rely on this kind of discipleship of what it means to be a good citizen. What happens when you don't have trust in institutions anymore? So Gallup has been running these polls since 1979 about confidence in American institutions. There are a bunch of different sectors that are represented, uh, healthcare sector, and government, law enforcement, the church is one of them. All time low. Only 27% of Americans have confidence in institutions. That's an all time low. What the church has got to be doing better, right? Gallup also ran this poll, and trust in pastors, clergy in general, including pastors, is also at an all-time low. When rating the honesty and ethical standards of clergy as high or very high, only 32%. Wow, that, that's an extraordinary challenge, and that is different from the social challenges that happened in the 1960s. Maybe the only time that we could have an analogy to the kinds of tensions. When there was still in the 60s social cohesion, when there was still institutional trust, there were possibilities for public engagement. We also have what I think uh, is regionalism, but now without borders. So uh, Colin Woodard, uh, a political journalist, kind of scanned a lot of social history and produced this synopsis of American history through this lens of the fact that we have actually always been multiple nations depending on region. So he wrote this book, American Nations, a history of the 11 regional, rival regional cultures of North America. In times of a good or during the Olympics, like everyone's just an American. You just root for the American track team or volleyball team. But really, America, based on immigration patterns, who immigrated where, based on which denominations are prominent in which areas of the country, based on the economics, like which industries were important for which region of the country, based on ideology, like one's views on gun violence, and even based on current patterns of religious migration of other religions, America has actually always been 11 different countries, identifiable by the kinds of foods that are prominent, the accents, and all these other factors. At a time period where people lived for multiple generations in the same neighborhood, you could believe that your region of America was America and have that uncontested. But what happens when the average American moves dozens of times over the course of life? And your view of what you understood America to be, wait a second, this neighborhood is nothing <laughs> what I imagined America to be. And social media now gives you immediate access to share your ideology of your region in a borderless way now. It has profound implications. And it is different from any other situation that we have faced in American history. And of course, the place of religion in America is drastically, dramatically different. Charles Taylor in Secular Age very well argued that we have moved from a society where belief in God is just the uncontested, unchallenged air we breathe. And now, while belief in God still exists, it has to be proven. It has to be contended for. Uh, we also live in a time where religion is less about truth and more about personal preference, what you believe, how it makes you feel. It's therapeutic. I think we're hitting kind of back to this weather report. Um, what something that Jock Barzin, uh, intellectual historian at Columbia, wrote in a book, Dawn to Dec Decadence. Uh, all that is meant by decadence is you know, it's kind of the conclusion of Western civilization as we know it. 
All that is meant by decadence is falling out. It implies in those who live in such a time no loss of energy or talent or moral sense. On the contrary, it is a very active time, full of deep concerns, but peculiarly restless, for it sees no clear lines of advance. The loss it faces is that of possibility. The forms of art as of life seem exhausted. The stages of development have been run through. Institutions function painfully. Repetition and frustration are the intolerable results. Boredom and fatigue are great historical forces. He wrote this a couple of decades ago, and it has proven to be more true now than even when he wrote this. I, I want to I note that, yes, it is a period of decadence in this way, but he, he has the seeds of hope in this. In this foment, there's an amazing opportunity that I think the church is called for. And I'm summarizing it as a catechesis for our times. There needs to be a new apologetic to how we present our faith. And it includes a more expansive understanding and application of the gospel. Comprehensive gospel that includes personal discipleship, but also civic discipleship. The average Christian evangelical has books on how to pray, how to study the Bible, maybe how to have a good marriage, but very few resources on civic discipleship. What are the public responsibilities, not the personal responsibilities of life? Not how to have integrity at work, but what is the integrity of work itself? This imagination for civic discipleship is precisely what I... I'm hoping that the work of the Henry Center can be gifting the church more broadly. Molly Worthen wrote in her assessment of evangelicalism in the Apostles of Reason, the crisis of authority in evangelical Christianity. Three features that stuck out to her. While evangelicals differ from one another on the details of their ideas about God and hum humankind, three elemental concerns unite them. How to repair the fracture between, the spiritual and between spiritual and rational knowledge. Think about all the debates of creation and evolution and how do we make sense of the things that we learn maybe in public schools with what's being taught in our churches. How to assure tr salvation and a true relationship with God. It's kind of the bread and butter of evangelicals. It's this third question that I think is profoundly contended in this moment. How to resolve the tenship, tension between the demands of personal belief and the constraints of a secularized public square. This is the whack-a-mole part of what we're experiencing right now. I want to take us to the discipleship that I think formed Jesus. When he was asked to summarize the law, what did he say? Love God, love your neighbor. That was his spiritual formation. We can't do better than Jesus' own spiritual formation for our spiritual formation. What does civic discipleship mean? What does it entail? I want to go back to the discipleship that Jesus undoubtedly experienced. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is a comprehensive discipleship. The use of terminology of heart, soul, and strength to describe love is is an attempt to use a syntame, a grammatical structure, to describe the all-encompassing nature. Yeah, we could probably try to tease apart, like a heart represents you know, emotions, or soul represents force, or strength represents our activity, but really, I think it's more like what we mean when we say heaven and earth, or night and day, or blood, sweat, and tears. It's a set of phrasing to say it encompasses all of existence. Heaven and earth means everything that there is. Night and day means all time. Blood, sweat, and tears means it's an encompassing effort. To love God in this way is an encompassing, absorbing, comprehensive navigation of life. Is our discipleship in churches this way? Are we fostering these types of followers of Jesus? When I think about how we disciple that kind of love, not just a rich prayer life and study your Bible and learn the worship songs that are necessary, not resolve conflicts in marriage, though we need to do that, but a more comprehensive discipleship. I want to think about uh, what follows. You know, here's the command, love the Lord your God. 
And then here's the discipleship. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is a 24-7 discipleship. It's what you do in your family life. Walking, rising. It's not something just delegated to the professionals on Sunday or on a special youth program on Friday night. It is 24-7 formation. And it's also social. You're not only to stick them on a individual's, an individual's hand, you're to put them on the doorframe of your houses and on your city gates. In other words, it is a communal. Loving God requires communal effort. Discipleship requires societal effort. So, you got the command. Love the Lord your God. All-encompassing. You got the discipleship mandate. 24-7, in family, wherever you go, on the city gates. So what do you actually talk about? It's the rest of the book of Deuteronomy. Yes, it's about having fidelity to the one true God and going to the uh, temple with your sacrifices. But think about the scope of discipleship that was addressed in Deuteronomy. Economic practices, Deuteronomy 15. At the end of seven years, you must cancel debts. I can imagine the conversation that would happen at home. Yeah, I know we used to have all this land for you to play on as kids, but I actually have to return this land to its former owner now. What? Why do we have to do that? Well, let me explain. Justice system. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. The morning newspaper became an opportunity to reflect on a divine view of justice. Creation care. If you come across a bird's nest, do not take the mother. You can take the chick, but don't take the mother. Why? Because if you take the mother, you will cause an extinction. You, you want birds to be able to propagate. And so even walking along with the kids on a hike, it became an opportunity for discipleship about the stewardship of creation. Building codes. When you build a new house, make a parapet. So that because on the second floor, that's what people used to do, have their porches on. You don't want your neighbor to be on your uh, roof and then fall off of it. And so even the ways that we think about housing became a discipleship moment. And at the end, in Deuteronomy 31, all of Israel was commanded at the Feast of Tabernacles every three years. You're to read this entire book of Deuteronomy, gather everyone, men, women, children, and the foreigners that reside among you so that they could bear witness to such a great God that would make these kind of laws that care for all of society. It became an incredible discipleship moment. Is this the discipleship that we have in our churches? in our educational institutions? What does it look like to train parents to teach children this form of discipleship? One of the things that the NAE, as a resource I was just talking about uh, with someone before uh, this lecture, that for the health of the nation, a call for civic responsibility. Oftentimes, evangelicals are represented, and sometimes rightfully so, in the media, as being concerned about one or two issues, and often very loudly and contentiously so. But the NE has long had this call for a more comprehensive application of the good news of Jesus to areas of civic responsibility. It includes, I'm not, I'm not going to give a detailed promo, promotion of this resource, you can get it, but it includes uh, biblical foundations on topics such as Christian civic engagement, what does the image of God or the Lordship of Christ, the kingdom of God, have to say to the, about that? Methods for our Christian civic engagement. Scripture, community, humility and civility as a discipleship issues. The structure of public life, maintaining order, restraining violence, and permitting the flourishing of all in society. And it includes various domains of our civic life. Yes, protecting religious freedom, but not just for Christians, for all those who live in society of other faiths or no faith, safeguarding the nature and sanctity of life from womb to tomb. How do we advocate for those with disabilities? 
Strengthening marriages, families, children in a comprehensive way. What are the economics of our society that would strengthen marriages? Seeking justice and compassion for the poor and vulnerable. Uh, we've reached out with a group of uh, other Christian leaders to ask um, the two candidates, uh, Biden and, and Trump, to produce some videos on their response, their vision for tackling poverty in our country. Because as followers of Jesus, we follow one who proclaimed good news to the poor, preserving human rights for all those, even those with whom we have profound disagreements, the treatment of prisoners, for instance, pursuing racial justice, reconciliation, promoting just peace, restraining violence, and caring for God's creation. A more comprehensive application of biblical faith. I'm going to give you a very specific example of what, what this might look like, this more comprehensive discipleship. So just a couple of weeks ago, we brought some Christian leaders, uh, um, black pastors and civic leaders, white pastors, civic leaders, institutional leaders, Asian American, Native American, Hispanic, we're all kind of gathered there to the, at the Legacy Museum, uh, a museum that traces the history uh, of slavery to mass incarceration uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, the exhibit includes um, not only stories of, and statistics, uh, but a section that commemorates those who had been lynched uh, in, in America. It's a really powerful experience. One of our desires is to say, who are the people that need to be engaged? Part of civic discipleship is finding the teachable people and engaging with them on issues. And rather than beginning with education, it might be a hard pill to swallow, given the context that I'm in, what does an experience do to create the need for education? So engage with teachable people. Rather than thinking about the bell curve, who are the radical fringes that we want to combat? Who's the movable middle that we want to engage? That's the bulk of the bell curve. And then what is the experience? We thought, rather than just talk about the theories of the history of America, let's just have a lived experience. And in that experience, produce human empathy. This issue is no longer your issue, it's my issue too, because I am here with you in this experience. I feel this with you. And then bring in the education to equip with resource, theological resources, practical resources. And then reproduce this process and expand. So I, I think of one particular moment where I was with a, was about 100 leaders there. And then we were uh, co-leading this with the National Unity Weekend and uh, Dr. Bernice King and Brian Stevenson. Um, there was a small group that we were going through this, the lynching museum memorial section of it. And there was a, a black pastor who just stopped and in near fainting pointed. And he saw the name of his great grandfather on this lynching memorial. He had heard stories passed down in his family, but he had never had confirmation. And he did not know if those stories were really true. He did not expect to see his grandfather's name. He just turned a corner, saw that his county was represented, and then went down the list. The other people who were there holding him, praying with him, mourning with him, can never unsee that moment, can never unfeel it, can never walk away from the responsibilities of discipleship that would encompass these issues. We need a catechesis of civic discipleship 
that engages, that provides experiences, that produces empathy, that equips, and that gives an imagination to expand all of this. Because the stakes are too high. We are always being discipled because we live in a world of competing gospels. Leslie Newbegin um, put it, I think, in a profound way. To affirm the gospel as public truth is to invite acceptance of a new starting point for thought, the truth of which will be proved only in the course of a life of reflection and action, which proves itself more adequate to the totality of human experience than its rivals. So when I think about the gospel, I think about this comprehensive application as, an, as, as the essence of the scope of the gospel's work. Mark, you know, whether or not you believe in Mark and priority uh, among the four gospels, uh, we can safely say that the gospel writers were not beholden to anyone to write their gospels in the way that they did. Why did Mark write the gospel this way? The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why didn't he begin with the genealogy that Matthew and Luke did? Why didn't he go way back in the glorious way that John did? Why begin his gospel this way? Because I think he wanted to convey the comprehensive nature of the gospel, competing against a rival gospel. Some of you may be familiar with the Priene calendar inscription, an inscription that was discovered in the ancient city of Priene, modern-day Turkey, that commemorates the birth of Caesar Augustus. Before uh, anyone could tweet out their propaganda, before social media could be used, before the engines of TV could be used, how did it, empires get their propaganda out? Well, Rome, they built really big, impressive things to portray their propaganda. And they put monuments and inscriptions everywhere. The calendar inscription commemorates the birth of Caesar Augustus with these words. The providence which has ordered our whole life, showing concern and zeal, has ordained the perfection of consummation for human life by giving it to Augustus by filling him with virtue for the doing of the work of a benefactor among men, by sending in him, in Augustus, a savior for us and those who come after us, to make wars to cease, to create order everywhere. The birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the gospel for the world that came by him. There was a competing gospel. It encompassed the totality of reality. Oh, that's that day and age under the Roman Empire. No, it's our day and age as well. I think of technology and the impacts of technology. You, you may have run across the Techno Optimist Manifesto came out last October. It was produced by a number of leaders in the Silicon Valley, some of the people who actually really did invent the internet. Uh, and uh, they authored this manifesto as a clarion call, I'm going to read a portion of it. And it's comprehensive. I mean, it goes on and it covers all aspects of life. The Techno-Optimist Manifesto. Our civilization was built on technology. Our civilization is built on technology. Technology is the glory of human ambition and achievement, the spearhead of progress and the realization of our potential. For hundreds of years, we've properly glorified this until recently. I am here to bring the good news. We can advance to a far superior way of living and of being. We have the tools, the systems, the ideas. We have the will. It is time, once again, to raise the technology flag. It is time to be techno-optimists. Now, I am very pro-technology. I'm so glad for this. But ideas come with ideologies. We always live in a time of competing gospels. What is the nature of our responsibility in this moment at this time? Now, a response to this could be, let's raise the swords of culture war. And in this final segment, I want to provide an alternative vision of discipleship that includes an understanding of our common life in a pluralistic society. I'm going to use the amazing grace of the architecture of Solomon's temple. So this is from the great eschatological vision in Isaiah chapter 2, this passage, on what the temple for God's people would represent. 
In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the chief among mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the nations will stream to it. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of, God, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Yes, personal forgiveness was involved, but it was a comprehensive good news encompassing every aspect of life. When Solomon built the temple on the top of Jerusalem, overlooking Jerusalem, he was tapping into what I would say is the common grace of humanity. All humans have always built their sacred spaces in prominent places. You think of the Parthenon on Athens. It was up top. Why? Because of the instinct to look up. We are embodied creatures. We experience the world in particular ways. Science Journal, prominent journal, had this article on the haptic responses, the tangible, tactile responses of humans to their environment. Same resume. If you put that resume on heavy paper and a heavy clipboard, same resume, and put it on light paper on a light clipboard, people will deem the heavy resume as more significant and a better candidate. If you put two people in soft chairs, they will negotiate less hard than if you put them on hard chairs. We, we are designed, all humans, to interact with the world in certain ways. I'm glad for non-Christians who have made discoveries in medicine because this is the common grace that God would call us just to interact and receive. What is it that we can receive from others in a pluralistic society? There are things, however, we, we need to refine. I think about the tripartite division of Solomon's temple. That was an architectural plan that existed in Syria, Palestine during the time of Solomon. You see this in a place called Ain Dara in modern-day Syria. Same kind of design, two pillars, and then a, front, a portico, a front room, and a back room. You also have this sense in which internally, the design of these capitals, the design of uh, the buildings were shared but refined in particular ways, improved upon. So uh, scholars have noted what looks like on the side right there, uh, Corinthian or Ionic or Doric capital that we associate with the Greeks, they actually didn't invent this. Solomon is the first known inventor of this kind of pillar that actually got imported back to Greece. There was a day and age where Israel, where God's people were cultural leaders because they refined things that they learned from their neighbors. Of course, there are things to reject. So this uh, mural that you see off to the side is uh, called the Investiture of Yarin Lim, uh, discovered in Mari uh, several centuries before the time of Solomon. Very similar iconography as what you would see inside the temple. Pomegranates, cherubim, sacred trees, all that you would see in Mari, you see inside the temple, except for any image of the king and of the god or goddess. The temple of Solomon was making a distinct point that we repudiate the ideology of the king as the divine representative on earth. All people were to be in the image of God, not just the king. The politicized use of religion, yes, I am making some comments here, was being repudiated by the Temple of Solomon. There are things that need to be rejected in our interaction with culture. And then there are things that we reimagine that the world longs for, taps into the deepest instincts. Solomon's Temple is quite unique in the Holy of Holies. This, this space that was a perfect cube Architects today recognize, and in fact, during the Renaissance, 
there was this rediscovery of Solomon's temple. And there are palaces in, in, in Europe that were built on this design. And in the center of some palaces was a, either a perfectly cubed room or a perfectly cylindrical room. And architects recognize that when you're in a space that's a perfect cube or a perfect sphere, you, you lose all sense of orientation. You don't know which way is up, which way is down, left or right, front or back. You're suspended in this kind of animation of timelessness. I think what's being indicated here is that ultimately all of this is a longing for a connection to God. The timeless, lost wonder of being connected to God. Our common life means that rather than in warfare mentality or fear mentality, we have to ask the questions. What can we receive as a gift of common grace? What can we refine and realign with the special revelation and special grace in Christ? What should we reject? And there are things in our culture to reject. And what can we reimagine? How can the true, real, good, and beautiful gospel be the headlight, not the taillight? How can we be leading, not lagging? I have one final story to tell, which I'm going to save after the Q&A time. We are in a particular cultural moment. And we have an opportunity within this foment not to relegate ourselves to fear, but to step into this with faith and courage and a more comprehensive discipleship as we seek to love God with all of who we are toward all that God has created. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, um, for that lecture. We have time now for lots of questions and conversations. I hope that uh, you have things to ask and ways to help us carry this conversation forward. Um, as you do have questions, you can make your way. There's a microphone in the back of the room. Please just make your way there in a second. Um, as they turn over the stage, let me just um, make one announcement, which is that, as Josh already said, this is our last event for the year. So we have no more for this school year. We will be back in the fall. We're excited to announce our public events for next year. In the meantime, if you missed any of these events this year, uh, you can find the videos on our YouTube channel of all of these events. We have the audio available on our podcast, so please do, if there's ones, um, you know, lectures we had earlier this year that you weren't able to attend, please do check those out. Um, I also wanna now invite up uh, Eric Flood, who's gonna be our moderator for today's event. We've had this with each of our events this year where we try to bring um, local ministers, whether pastors or people in parachurch ministries, um, to help us think about these topics on a more down-to-earth level. What, what difference does this make as we actually um, try to minister to God's people? So Eric Flood is a grad of Trinity. Um, he serves, well, he's been a pastor. He's a church planter in Ohio. He pastored here in the city of Chicago for almost 20 years. And now he serves in campus ministry doing faculty and grad ministry at the University of Chicago. So we're really grateful uh, that he's here with us. I'm going to invite Dr. Kim back up to the stage as well. Um, they're going to get the conversation started, but please do, as you have questions, um, make your way to the microphone as well. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Thank you, Josh, for the invitation. Um, in the room are faculty that I sat in your classes. There are people I consider mentors in the room, and so it's a real privilege and honor to be here. And thank you, Dr. Kim, for what is such a timely message uh, starting what I hope is a very lively conversation. I've got enough questions to take up our entire 30 minutes, but I'm trusting you've got questions to ask as well, but uh, I get us, I'll get us started. Um, Dr. Kim, I just wanna start with saying thank you for representing evangelicalism, the kind that I want to be associated with when that word is in such dispute in our culture. Um, so when I've heard you on podcasts and, and speaking, I'm, I'm grateful for your voice in the public square and representing the fullness of the gospel for um, the whole gospel for the whole person for the whole world. Uh, you do that very well. Um, when I was pastoring, one of the things that I sensed increasingly is that everybody older than me only wanted to talk about personal salvation, and everybody younger than me only wanted to talk about 
social implications of the gospel? And I wanted to say yes. And of course, that's, that's a generalization, a stereotype. Um, but I struggled to find ways to talk about that well. And I'm sensing in some of what I'm hearing from you almost a third way of looking at that, using this language of civic discipleship or um, uh, uh, civic catechesis. And um, I really appreciate that. And as I heard you talk about Deuteronomy, I'm like, there's an awesome sermon series in that that I'd love to hear you preach or someone here develop um, and preach through that because it's all there. Like Deuteronomy 6 is so central to my philosophy of ministry and family ministry, but seeing the book in its fullness and wholeness has such potential, um, of course, that Jesus drew on so repeatedly in his own ministry. So I just want to say thank you for all of those things. And I want to start with uh, a personal question, uh, if you'd be willing to go there. You strike me as someone who is able <laughs> to step into potentially complex and contentious situations and be a non presence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you stepped into this role in January of 2020, <laughs> and you're still here. <laughs> and from our conversation, you're even hopeful. And I want to know, um, how have you maintained that, and how did you become the kind of person who could stand in some of these gaps uh, without letting anxiety take over? That's a challenge, isn't it? Um, I, I would say it's a combination of, of, of a few things. There's a bit, you asked uh, a question that could be answered clinically, uh, but you've invited me to answer a bit more personally, which, which I will do. I think my experience uh, in an immigrant family has played a deep role in this. So my parents immigrated to America in the 1960s, mid-60s, like right in a moment of deep cultural convulsion. And this was a time before they could Google what does it mean to be an American, right? They, they came over and who would train them? How would they learn what it mean, meant to be an American when Americans themselves were deeply contesting what it meant to be American? Uh, Part of that immigrant experience have been born in New York City during that time period by parents who are navigating the complexity of life in America meant that there was a certain comfort in multiple identities and multiple ambiguities, right, simultaneously. Uh, am I Korean? Am I American? What does that mean? Americans don't even know what it means to be American. Am I a city person? Well, yes, that's true, but I also spent a significant portion of my childhood, not just in New York City, in the Bronx, uh, but in a coal town in the foothills of Appalachia in western Pennsylvania. That was also part of my upbringing. Am I a city person? Am I a country boy? Well, yeah, that's both part of it. What I think has been deeply embedded, even before I became a Christian, and eventually I did become a Christian, uh, was deeply embedded was life is ambiguous. Everyone has a story. Their stories are deeply embedded in their location in life. And having moved around and having navigated the in-between spaces left me comfortable with in-between spaces left me comfortable with the complexity of saying, yeah, you, one person could have multiple ways of navigating life as a city person, as a country person, as Korean American, and so forth. Um, also experienced hospitality in multiple ways. So my parents were deeply indebted to a Lutheran pastor who did relief work in Korea when they were in Korea. I, one of my earliest memories of the Bronx was living in the basement of an Irish Catholic family, the McGoverns. And their kids taught me how to ride my big wheel and how to get to the park. Uh, the person who eventually led me to Christ was a Baptist youth pastor. And for a time period, I attended a Methodist church. Eventually went on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ. So what I experienced was hospitality, Christian hospitality from multiple sources that made me deeply appreciative to what the body of Christ more broadly has to offer. Um, and I'm grateful for that. So that, there, there's embedded in there the two things of comfort with ambiguity, living in the liminal spaces, multiple identities, and a profound appreciation 
for God's hospitality expressed through people I did not even know to name with labels. They have now come with labels too quickly, but what was common was the expression of faith and charity in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Um, I want to encourage everybody to start moving towards the mic to ask questions, and I'll pose one more. Um, so you're describing some experience of cohesion, which was one of your first diagnoses, that there's a lack of social cohesion in our nation. And you are also describing this like rich evangelicalism with multiple streams that are each life-giving in their own way, which is some of what drew me to Trinity in the late 90s to study here, because that was some of what was happening here. So I'm wondering if you could answer both in the context of Trinity, but then maybe in our churches or neighborhoods, what are some practices or steps we could take um, to cultivate that kind of cohesion that is missing? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a deep, deep recognition that human flourishing requires community, right? And, and it's not just within this kind of renewed rebranding of the church of like, oh, come to church because you need community. I mean, this is hard data. So one of the things that I had the chance to do uh, through my work at the NAE was participate in um, a conference hosted by Harvard uh, at the Harvard Human Flourishing Project. This is a secular university. And one of the presenters, uh, sociologist Robert Putnam, made the point that evangelical Protestants 100 years ago, when the country was experiencing deep social upheaval, economic disparity, um, church membership was really low back then. I mean, maybe hovering around 40% from his research. Now, he's not doing this as a Christian himself. He's a sociologist. Uh, but what happened 100 years ago was that there was this leadership by evangelical Protestants, and he named that at, at the secular conference. And he appealed to evangelical Protestants to kind of get their act together and lead again because the country needs them. And he was saying, I'm saying this as a sociologist in a place where this is not something that would be taught very often. So it's not just a rebranding that community is important. It is a discovery that this is essentially how God has made us. And part of what the church has to offer is that this is the DNA of the church. We have not just been saved from sin, we have been saved into a body. All the metaphors are ones that are deeply connected with one another, right? Body, family, a building. I mean, we're just deeply connected. So what I would strongly desire and pray for is in this moment, for churches to recapture this robust sense of the corporate identity, not just ecclesially, but it is part of soteriology. We are not just saved from, we are saved into a body. And uh, I, I think if we get both parts, it's not a sacrifice of the gospel, right? It's not just, oh, personal salvation. It becomes the personal implications of a corporate salvation. That's a difference from saying I've been personally saved and it has some social implications. I would argue that scripture gives us this vision that it has always been corporate. You've been saved from, personally, eternal separation from God, saved into a family, a body, a building, a kingdom. You can't have one without the other, uh, except nowadays it seems like we often try to have one without the other. Right. Well, what you're describing is certainly appealing to me. Um, I'm glad we got some questions, so would you please introduce yourself briefly and uh, then pose your question. Um, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, David Gies, I serve as a pastor in a church in the northern part of the state. And one, um, just one bit of gratitude and then one question. Thank you, I really appreciated, especially so what stuck out, you're calling us to help reimagine in the sense of when you have the true gospel, you have something that the world needs. And that was, I thought, just a very fitting and healthy call for us. How can we be cultural leaders in shaping the world? Because we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then connected to that, so thank you for that. Connected to that, um, 
this could be broad, this could be in some ways a challenging question to kind of summarize or categorize, but what are the top three or four uh, books, resources that you personally have found yourself reading uh, that have uh, helped and or things that you're actively wrestling through now, especially in that reimagining? How can uh, we as believers and faith leaders and church leaders um, in a healthy and good way be on the offense and showing how the gospel renews and reshapes the world. Maybe three or four books or resources that uh, you personally have found to be very fruitful in that area. Broad category, but just curious. Yeah, I think one book that comes to mind is a work by Miroslav Wolf, Public Faith. I think that's a helpful kind of entry point into some of these topics, uh, while simultaneously being quite substantial. Uh, Rowan Williams, has written a book, uh, I can't think I can see the cover right now. Um, I, I think of Faith in the Public Square, uh, and it's a fuller treatment. Uh, rather than go through a number of um, kind of a bibliography from world Christianity or different uh, communities, uh, a book that I might recommend that does that, some of that work for us, different uh, religious tradition, or different uh, denominational traditions with the, within Christianity, as well as different ethnic backgrounds, uh, is a book by Luke Bretherton uh, called Christ in Our Common Life. Uh, and I, I think that you can go through his biography and get denominational traditions as well as um, various ethnic racial communities in their theological reflections that I think is profoundly illuminating. And so those are three books I would recommend as starting places. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about, um, I, let me rephrase. In our cultural moment, I hear evangelicals talking really frequently about kind of balancing grace and truth or holding those two things together, making sure we show the grace and empathy and engagement, but making sure we also proclaim truth. And I noticed that proclamation wasn't a big part of anything you said today, though I know that obviously you affirm that. But there has been kind of an impulse within evangelical circles to release statements or to very clearly denounce or affirm particular things. Uh, and I'd love to hear you th like kind of muse about how that fits into a pattern of civic discipleship. Um, obviously, we are discerning for ourselves what to reject, but how important do you think it is to kind of do that public-facing clarification work, um, and how can it be done well? Yeah. The challenge in doing that right now is nothing is in-house anymore. Social media makes everything a public relations statement. There's a kind of communication that becomes essential for the Christian community, because it appeals to a shared understanding of grace, of the authority of scripture. Uh, and you could take whatever cultural issue it is, you know, human sexuality or what's happening uh, in the Middle East right now, or the issues of when life begins, you know, all the kind of cultural debates that exist. Immigration is a huge one right now as well. Um, when you have an in-house family discussion, you presume certain relationships that you can bank on, the relational capital that you have. The difficulty in statements right now is that even statements that are made toward the Christian community, this is supposed to be an in-house conversation, that, that doesn't exist anymore. Everything is a public conversation. So now I think the question has to be asked, not only is this statement important for us to make as discipleship for the church, and I can presume a certain set of relationships that would sustain a difficult conversation. I can presume a set of shared theological commitments that would explain and undergird the, the statement. The tip of the iceberg is the statement, but I can assume this kind of rich underneath the sea iceberg of theology. When you make a statement like that that's public, you don't have the shared relationship and you don't have the shared worldview. And it becomes missiologically challenging for the very people you're trying to reach. So I'm not gonna, giving a simple answer because everything is you know, difficult. But what I'm, going to, what I'm attempting to do is to say there's a different kind of context in which statements need to be made. Uh, there's, there's context we believe is just for Christians, but it's never going to stay that way. And it may be viewed as a discipleship uh, statement, 
but it becomes then a missional statement to the rest of the world because it's posted, it's tweeted, it's made a, an issue of, oh, see what these crazy people believe, and then prov pr provides some barriers then of outreach. Uh, and, and again, does that mean we don't make those statements? No, absolutely not. Uh, we, we, there are occasions where we need to clearly define what we understand human identity to be, clearly define what we understand life or immigration or our responsibilities to the poor, and the nature of the gospel for personal proclamation. I'm not on staff with Campus Crusade anymore, but you, you can't take the staff out of me either, right? I mean, I, st I am compelled because people's eternal destinies are at stake. But what I begin to realize is that my personal evangelism is less successful without a more comprehensive setting. I'm gonna give one, I'm gonna presume one final example toward that, what I mean by that. So we had a neighbor, my wife and I, Tony, that uh, in Boston we were you know, sharing, trying to share life with and introduce her to Jesus. We finally got to the point where we were hosting them at dinner at our place and we thought, okay, now's the moment we can invite them to church. We finally built the relational capital necessary to invite them to church, and we did so. And uh, she responded, oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't come to church, I'm a scientist. Now, if you read it one way, you can, as an outsider, look at this and say, oh, you know, she's saying that I'm too smart to go to church and I can't go to you, your church. She didn't mean it that way. What she meant was, I'm a scientist, I don't know if I'd be welcomed at your church, and I'd like you too much to get you in trouble, so I want to spare you the discomfort of bringing me to your church. Wow. Yeah. We need to realize that our statements are never in-house. We have implications of how we approach things to the very world that we're trying to personally bring to Jesus our public discipleship has created a context in which the personal evangelism cannot be heard. Who would have thunk that a scientist, because of the public ways in which faith and science has been pursued, would have a personal obstacle to salvation? This is why I think the two cannot be disconnected. Thank you. We've got a line, so go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, I'm wondering, we're here at a seminary, we're training to be people who walk with the everyday believer in engaging in this, in this reality. And um, I talked to some of my colleagues who are in ministry, and they're saying, I didn't learn any of this in seminary. I was not prepared for this. And I only graduated, I graduated less than 10 years ago. So I was wondering just some of your thoughts on how an institution like Trinity or places where we're training ministers, people to go out into the world, the culture that we live in, to engage in these discussions, to disciple people into these types of discussions so that we can bear uh, a witness, a visible, compelling witness in this type of world. What are some things we can be doing, ways of thinking, avenues of spiritual formation that we as a seminary, as a place of training, can equip our students with to help them be prepared for what's next? Yeah. I think seminaries right now, for so many reasons, um, and Christian institutions more generally, reasons that I've mentioned at the beginning of the kind of diagnostic element of the talk, uh, but there's also, you know, just financial reasons. There are all sorts of constraints that exist. Um, this is a, a moment uh, of deep questioning the nature of education, uh, but it's also a moment of incredible opportunity. So thank you for asking the question that way. What, what can be done? Um, I think to reverse engineer uh, our education, what are the kinds of questions that younger generations people 10 years out, I think it would be great to have an opportunity, a task force, uh, that Trinity would have a task force of pastors 10 years into their job, 
come back and say, these are the classes that actually would have helped. These are the experiences that actually would have helped. Um, these are the kinds of problems that I have no answer for. Um, I, I, I about predestination, I can tell you about all sorts of absolutely important things for our understanding of God, um, but I, I have no clue. Should I have preached on Black Lives Matter or not? What do I say about what's unfolding in the Middle East? Do I just ignore those issues as this is not the work of the church? But the fact is, it's got to be the work of the church. I'm not saying that you got to be preaching, and I'm definitely not saying that this is exactly what you need to preach, but I am saying that it would be a dereliction of the church's duty to proclaim a gospel that touches upon all life in the face of a gospel that is right now trying to touch upon all life, whether it's the techno-optimist or politics that are seeking to replace religion. I mean, there was an interesting study done that it used to be the case that people were less likely to marry across religion. Right? You, you were less likely to marry outside of your religion if you're Christian, less likely to meet, marry a Jew or uh, a Muslim, less likely if you're Catholic to marry a Protestant. Uh, now it's less likely that you would marry across political lines than you would across religious lines. Wow. Everyone is being discipled. You, the question is, are we, who, who are we being discipled by? And the church um, and education needs to have these kinds of questions. And the, this is the last comment I would make about that. The experiential element of it, I... I think not only learning from other practitioners, what are the actual questions, but to ask um, what are the experiences that would lead to empathy, um, to train the whole person as being more than just brains on sticks, but the formation that takes place when you are exposing people to certain life experiences. Dr. Kim, I'm so glad you raised that, because that's what was stirring in me, your story of being at the Legacy Museum and then the lynching memorial was profound, and uh, I would encourage anyone here, if you haven't had the experience of visiting those places to do so, I had the honor with a group called Chicago Fellowship to be in those places this last June, um, a, known as Sankofa, our civil rights tour, um, and there are resources that are powerful that I would think the Mosaic movement here would have access to those kinds of experiences that I've, uh, I've celebrated knowing the kinds of things that have been cultivated here uh, in the last 20 years um, and would encourage more of that. Um, Dr. Kim also was not very uh, promotional of some of the resources of the NIE, so I will be. Uh, when I was a pastor, I read the document for the health of the nation and found great value in it. It has to be done, though, proactively, not in the heat of the moment, I think. Mm -hmm. So there are things that in the course of preaching, we're going to have to at least acknowledge without maybe changing the sermon for the Sunday. You may have to mention it in a pastoral prayer or if it fits somewhere within um, the Lordship of Christ to raise. So you're acknowledging what's going on. But in terms of cultivating this kind of civic discipleship, we've got to do that proactively from like the core out. And for the health of the nation now that's been 10 years old, has a video curriculum that I think could really facilitate some great conversations within churches uh, that could supplement the kind of resources you received in seminary. So um, I would highly recommend those. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a student discipleship pastor. Um, so everything with your answer that you just gave resonates with me mm -hmm. and being prepared for that. Um, but uh, in the past couple of years, the 1960s has been a theme that I've been hearing over and over again. I was reading The Pastor by Eugene Peterson, mm -hmm. and he talks about how a local psychologist invited a group of faith leaders to come together to help with what was going on. And then a couple weeks ago, in our current context, a school administrator invited a group of faith leaders to come together and help tackle what's going on. Um, and so it would seem like not that history exactly repeats itself, but it echoes itself mm -hmm. that we're in a similar situation. Um, in my only context as a millennial for the 1960s is Forrest Gump. Um, <laughs> so 
therefore, what did the church do well then? How did they drop the ball then too? And not necessarily, I'm not asking like, let's just repeat what they did and do it better, but uh, maybe there's some better context there to just contemplate and chew on and think through, you know, how can we move forward more quickly by looking at history a little bit? That's great. Um, well, I can't speak directly for a personal experience having been born at the very end of the, the 60s, um, but I, I can speak to the NAE's experience. And part of what I, I think our job is as, as leaders is to understand and tell truth and be gracious about it, but repentant when necessary. So in 1957, uh, 56, the NAE had passed a resolution uh, saying that evangelical organizations, NAE included, but member organizations, um, should address the issue of racism, uh, that it was counter uh, to the work of, of God in the world. And that resolution seemed bold. It was, you know, talked about human rights and predates the language of civil rights. But it boded well for the role that evangelicals, predominantly white evangelicals in, in that uh, space, could offer a gospel response to what was unfolding in the great social uh, unrest of that day. But sad to say, I would say many within the NAE actually did not show up in the 60s. Um, and it became a much more complicated thing of like, oh, maybe this is communism in some form that's coming in, and so we have to distance ourselves. And it was a missed opportunity having made this incredible call, resolution, this clarion call for a gospel-oriented good news response, um, I often wonder, had people shown up, what would have been different? Would we be in a different space right now in our country? I, I believe we would have. Why didn't they show up? I think this comes back to experience and empathy. When an issue is of theoretical importance, it will fade when you're faced with emotional trauma. Um, I'm going to use examples back then, and then you can kind of apply them now. Um, when you theoretically say racism is bad, but do not have deep deep embedded experiences of friendship across racial difference. When your communities are fairly homogenous, your access to empathy to sustain what you teach is reduced. You then are responding to the anger that is coming from within your community with whom you have relationships and you share a deep well of emotional resonance. In the end, oftentimes relationships trump our convictions. We will change our convictions on all sorts of things because we have someone that has changed our mind. We, we can't get around the fact. You know, why is it that so many younger people in our, um, find it difficult that Jesus would be the exclusive way, truth, and life? Well, when we were supporting missionaries to reach uh, the people, the lost, hundreds and thousands of miles away and just get reports back, it's easy to believe in the exclusivity of Christ. But when most of your friends are not Christians or come from other religions and they are actually living really moral lives, emotionally, it's a lot more difficult to say Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life because you are now invested empathetically with others. So when I think about some of the failures, there were great convictions, maybe even great theology, but not great rich relationships that would sustain the kind of challenges that existed. And the relationships were still fairly homogenous and internal. Uh, I think we have an opportunity, a mandate to rectify that, uh, to, to expose ourselves to experiences that give us deep empathy and to, can sustain us in difficult moments. So, yeah, anyone that has had a relative die of cancer, you all of a sudden care deeply as a pastor for all the, the congregants in your church who have a person dying of cancer. That becomes now a personal issue to you. If you've experienced life working with 
an immigrant or working with a community uh, who has a very different life experience to the point that becomes a part of your life, then your application points and sermons become different. When you talk about disappointment with God, it's not just about the fact that your kid didn't get into college. You're now talking about this single mom who doesn't know where the next meal will come from for that child because now that's a personal friend of yours. So our, we, we need to expand our empathy. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, in Chicagoland, there have been some rich relational networks among pastors that I know I benefited from. So I would heard from David's predecessor, Todd Habegger, about some um, Lake County uh, collections of pastors that I'm sure could be easily discovered. Within the city of Chicago, there's several. So um, there's Chicagoland United in Prayer that has an annual citywide prayer meeting, and Doc Feuder is a part of that. And then there's Together Chicago bringing multiple institutions together to address violence, and uh, Michael Allen and David Dillon are a part of that. And then John and Dave Ferguson with the um, New Thing movement provided a place for me to meet pastors from across the city, and they have a vision for multi-ethnic, trans-denominational church planting. And from relationships I built there, I started to experience some of what you're describing that shifted how I understood how to navigate things locally. So I just want to amplify that and encourage you to seek out those networks. Um, let's go with the next question. Okay. Thank you for your lecture, Dr. Kim. Uh, I appreciated how you really brought out the aspect of the early church that didn't seek to force their beliefs on other people. Um, I've noticed throughout church history that as the church gains political power, that conviction starts to go away, uh, whether it's Augustine's compelled them to come in or, uh, or various other leaders throughout history. Um, how, how do you think we can preserve that um, separation between church and state, not just not a complete isolation, but the church influencing the state without the state persecuting believers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the essence of uh, persuading people you know, doing all to persuade some. Uh, Paul demonstrates that the, the essence of what we mean by winning people to Jesus, um, not bludgeoning them to Jesus. And we recognize that that's a, a deep impulse um, because we want people to come in a non-coercive way to saving faith. Um, this is how we are entering into the kingdom. Um, nevertheless, there is a deep desire to share our faith. And, and so I think some of the tensions that we all experience based on personality, where we grow up in the church, what kind of church, we will gravitate toward more uh, initiative-oriented forms of evangelism, engagement, uh, or less. So there's a, the, the, that's the kind of faith part. There were, I, I hear a couple of aspects to your question. One is, you know, the, what does it mean to have a non-coercive but yet robust evangelism, reaching out to people? Um, so I want to emphasize, per your point and a, a question you had raised of, you know, diminishment of the proclamation because of the nature of this talk and the elevation of the kind of demonstration of comprehensive gospel. Um, I do want to emphasize people need to be one to Jesus Christ. I mean, that, that is absolutely true, and we have to be less timid about it. I also want to say that a very strong case can be made that uh, it would be an insincere thing for us to neuter ourselves and uh, our faith, to kind of remove this sense of the robustness of why we believe what we believe in the public square. I think a genuine pluralism uh, that we should be all arguing for is that let's bring our whole selves uh, to the discussion. And that's the complicated nature of democracy. The separation of church and state, I would argue for, is not a... Uh, uh, relinquishing uh, or finding a common ground with language that is removing all sense of religious motivation. It is to say we have to do the difficult job of bringing our whole selves to the congregation or conversation, which includes fully Christian, but translating it in ways that we do in evangelism, missionally. I don't jump into all sorts of technical terms when I'm sharing my faith with someone. I find points of connection, but I'm bringing my whole self, life experience and my experience of Jesus, uh, to the conversation, even as I'm trying to translate it. 
That's the part that I think is particularly challenging. We should bring our whole selves to the conversation. We should do a better job of translating what that whole self looks like in the public square, recognizing that we can no longer have the luxury of sharing a common social cohesion of worldview that permits us to do this as the default language of our country. That's not the default language of our country anymore. We have to actually make the case and translate it like Paul did in Acts chapter 17. You have to translate this. It's a missional moment. It's not a maintenance moment. I think we've been stuck in this maintenance of faith moment in our country when we should be moving to the missional moment of thinking about how can we be translating uh, this language. So make this our last two questions. We'll take the question from the floor and then I just want to tee you up for a conclusion. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Kim, for today's lecture. Uh, my, uh, my name is Juan, uh, THM Old Testament students. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we bring out God's creation into the public discipleship or public education? You know, the creation, evolution is a hot topic. Also, there is a uh, duration, creation, activity, or age of the earth. Also, they are also important topic, but Genesis and narrative or biblical teaching tell us we are equally created in God's image. Also, it talks about the dominion mandate, uh, stewardship, creation care. It also talks about the biblical kind of marriage structure. So how can we bring out the, the big picture of God creation into the public discipleship? How can we make a connection to the public? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, the, I would say there are two elements to it. One is internal to the church, uh, conversations that we have internally in our discipleship, which needs to be much more expansive, right? The, the, the sense that we are teaching more than just how to pray or how to come to church better, uh, but we are engaging with the range of issues. So think about the curriculum. I'm just, I, I am truly struck by the fact that, uh, you know, oftentimes we give kids, you know, the flannel graph, do you remember those, the flannel graph version of Jesus? In Deuteronomy 31, these kids were not dismissed to children's church. And I'm not trying to disparage children's church. I'm glad that, you know, there are ways and children get specialized time together. But I just think about the reading of the entire book of Deuteronomy, and children were expected to sit through that. What does that say about the level of expectation that we have for our children. Uh, I think about what public schools expect of our kids. I mean, my, my son, you know, as a senior, could do calculus, and that stuff that, like, Isaac Newton was discovering about gravity he was doing in physics class and way beyond. I mean, it's the basic expectation that we have of our kids, the average 17-year-old of what they could do from their public school, seems vastly different from our basic expectation uh, within the church of what they can learn. And then I think the second part of public engagement um, is, uh, I, I think if we're better training people internally and then giving them a missional mindset, we'll be able to better translate externally. Right. So I want to wrap with this. Um, this is such a moment we're living in. An election year, college campuses are being shut down with protests regarding Israel-Palestine issues, what's going on in Gaza, and yet, I hear from you, Dr. Kim, this hopefulness. Mm. So I'd love for you to wrap us up by describing what makes you hopeful or why are you hopeful or how can we join you in being hopeful about what you see God doing? So I'm gonna use an example of uh, a prayer that God answered that I had forgotten to, that I even pray, prayed. It was a, a prayer 18 years uh, in the making. Uh, this is gonna get very personal. So my daughter, uh, Naomi, was born with Down syndrome 19 years ago. And she was in the NICU for the first 10 days of her life. Uh, a plexiglass had separated me from my daughter, couldn't even touch her. Right? I remember sitting and praying next to her uh, incubator, Lord, um, beyond the, the breath and the pulsing of blood, what am I actually praying for? We gave her the middle name of joy, uh, based on Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And we prayed that 
my wife and I, that she would not only receive the joy of the Lord, but that she would be a source of the joy of the Lord. 18 years later, so a year and a half ago, we were in the country, uh, African country of Malawi, in a predominantly Muslim district, visiting some of the work of World Relief, which is the humanitarian aid organization of the NAE, in partnership with this group called Why Malawi. And we were in this Muslim district uh, at a kids' camp that was at an Anglican church staffed by Presbyterians and Pentecostals and Baptists, sanctioned by the Muslim chiefs of the area because they had witnessed Christians enter into their spaces teaching better agricultural practices as an expression of Christian faith, uh, helping to put marriages together, a biblical worldview, founding vocational training centers and microfinancing, describing from scripture what it means for a community to be empowering one another. It was a civic discipleship. Because of that, the Muslim chiefs were permitting the Jesus film to be shown, and they were coming to Christ. Thousands of Muslims in this area are coming to Christ. I experienced Naomi in this village. Yeah, they went, they heard this, you know, religious leader from America was coming, so they asked me to give a few words. But they actually invited uh, Naomi, the chief, one of the chiefs, invited Naomi to share some words. I had no idea what she would say. I, I thought she might go off on Disney princesses, or who knows why, I mean, she loves Disney princesses. She got up and she, you know, shared, thank you, and want to let you know that God loves you. Looked at the kids, study hard, learn to read, and she concluded by saying Zukomo, which is thank you in Chichewa. And I realized that God had answered my prayer in ways that I could not imagine. That Naomi gets to be a part of a comprehensive gospel. Because from that, there was a woman who had eight children, the last three born with a disability, a husband had left because he thought her cursed by God. And uh, some of the Christian workers were trying to reach her. And through, after that little speech, uh, it opened up some space for her family to get connected with the relief services of World Relief. I think this, if God could do this, in a predominantly Muslim district with all sorts of challenges and limitations. We're not talking about a megachurch that's well-resourced. I looked at this and I thought, I went expecting to encounter economic poverty, and I did. I walked away seeing spiritual prosperity. And I flew back to a country with so much economic prosperity but not nearly the same kind of spiritual prosperity that I witnessed in Malawi. I think this is a moment for us to not lament the lack of resources and the marginalization of faith, but to return with a more robust gospel that touches all aspects of life and to actually believe that people will come to faith in Jesus. Amen. So before we thank Dr. Kim, uh, would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, you are the one who births things like we just heard about in Malawi, and you use Naomi and people like us. So we praise you and thank you. We thank you for the work of the Henry Center and what we've heard today and throughout this year. We ask your blessing, your spirit to fill Dr. Kim for the work you've given him to do. I pray that the hope that he has in the gospel would spread to his entire team and to us as well, and we pray that you would do a new thing among us. And God, you would bless the work of Trinity, and you would, by your spirit, prompt us with what it would look like to live faithfully with what we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Kim for today?